Okay, I have about 19 microphones on me. Can everybody hear me okay over here? Everybody? I want to tell you that you have a great Monarch Way Station already started over here. You've got your spring uh, plants going on. You've got your fall plants going on. And I really want to thank you for having me here today. Now, I am French, and so I'm going to have a little hard time staying in one place while everybody videotapes me. But I'm hoping I'm going to be able to answer all your questions. We're going to talk about creating a Monarch Way Station. We're going to have a slight review on the Monarch life cycle. But there won't be a test today. Okay, so let's begin. What is a Monarch Way Station exactly? Well, a Monarch Way Station has a real place in the environment. And a Monarch Way Station is essentially a place that provides resources for two specific reasons. One is to provide a resource for the spring migrating monarchs, a place for them to lay eggs. Another reason is to provide a resource for the monarchs that are migrating south, a place for nectar. They have a lot of miles to go both ways. And what we're going to do is provide for them a sort of buckies, if you will, particularly in your urban and suburban environments. I'm very excited to be here to kind of approach these issues. I speak a lot in the hill country, but they have lots of wide open spaces. You still have some pretty good prairie areas here. I've been with the Katy Prairie and seen what they do over there, and it's pretty amazing work. But there are suburban and urban issues that we really need to talk about tonight. So let's move on. Why do we even need Monarch Way Stations? Why do you think? Do you see much green here? What's a monarch to do in the spring? Looking for milkweed here. What's a monarch to do in the fall? Coming through, needing energy, needing fat, needing lipids to get home. What's a monarch to do? Well, they're not going to find it here on first landing. Do you know that we are actually developing in this country at the rate of 6,000 acres a day? That's over 2.2 million acres a year. That's development only. That doesn't include the adoption of herbicide tolerant uh, corn and soy. We can add cotton to that agricultural change now. Uh, even here in Texas, we have well over 100 million acres now of croplands that um, no longer provide milkweed in their crop rows. We're also spraying roadsides and we're still mowing. So even our farm roads and so forth that we used to be able to provide nectar and milkweed are no longer doing that. So we have some changes we need to make. But the monarchs have another unique challenge. They overwinter in the OML forests of Michoacan in Mexico at about 11,000 feet. And in the last 30 years, 20 or 30 years, they have been foresting, deforesting at the rate of about 2.5% um, a year. So they're actually uh, decimating the forests that these monarchs overwintering, creating a real climate issue. The, 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 excuse me. Because these forests actually offered uh, a very uh, exclusive climate. Um, they were able to overwinter on the barks and the limbs, providing a sort of thermal atmosphere here. And once you remove a lot of that canopy, that thermal atmosphere no longer survives. In 2002, we lost 33 million monarch butterflies. In 2016, we lost closer to 70 million monarch butterflies. Farm and ranch land in Texas is also being converted. It's being converted to agriculture, and it's also being converted to subdevelopment. If you look at the inset map on the coastal flyway, you'll see that um, one of the major central flyways comes right through the center of Texas. So you can kind of see Dallas, Fort Worth there. You can see Houston, New Braunfels, San Antonio. Um, the coastal flyway here, the central flyway here, these were our largest areas converting uh, land to development and um, in West Texas converting also here to, uh, to agriculture using some herbicide tolerant crop. So we lost 1.1 million acres in our major flyways. Why is Texas important? Do you know that Texas is the first place that these monarchs choose to lay their eggs when they're migrating north? So that monarch that has lived eight months now uh, flying north to lay its eggs before it expires and produce the first generation of summer breeding monarchs 
needs milkweed. Many other insects have evolved over the last 30 million years to use multiple host plants, but the monarch has not done so. It can only use milkweed to lay its eggs on. Those caterpillars, that larva, can only feed on milkweed. There is no other choice. They cannot survive on any other host plant. If you look at the population numbers, since 1994, you can certainly see that uh, we started to produce uh, herbicide tolerant crops right around 1997. Now we actually had approximately one billion monarch butterflies about 1995. We are never going to see those numbers again. I hate to be the one to break that to you, but I can tell you that we could work really hard to sustain a decent population. We can work hard to sustain a population that will continue to migrate. The threat, the endangered threat, is in the migratory population. The Danaeus plexippus that we know, this migrating monarch, needs to maintain a certain number of, in population to continue to migrate efficiently. There are other Danaeus species that do not migrate. And the danger here is that we do not sustain the number of monarchs that we need to continue the migration. Now, when we talk about 33 million or 165 million butterflies, we aren't really talking about a butterfly that we're thinking is going to become extinct. But what we're talking about is the migratory phenomenon becoming extinct. And to me, that would be similar to losing the Mona Lisa perhaps. So if you look at these numbers, you can see there's a real correlation in declining monarch numbers to the types of habitat decimation that we just talked about. So why do we need monarch waste stations? Oops, excuse me. One thing that I have found really interesting in the last years of monarch uh, education and outreach is that monarchs have become kind of the beacon or the icon for many other conservation issues, one of which is the decline in bee populations. The monarch is a really familiar insect. There isn't a child practically in this country that doesn't recognize a monarch butterfly. I remember monarch butterflies as a child. How many of you as children remember monarch butterflies? In very big numbers sometimes along the rivers and roosting on their way down. When monarchs began their decline and it became a national issue, that issue pointed to other problems that we knew were happening but weren't talking about. The decline of bees, the decline of hummingbirds, the decline of bats. When we create and sustain monarch habitat, all pollinators benefit. So we can keep that in mind. Monarch way stations have seen a resurgence. Now we always uh, we always endorsed creating monarch way stations, and we saw a real resurgence in interest in monarch way stations. We saw a resurgence in monarch way stations once they became the the pollinator issue became a federal issue. So what had happened was. There was a tri-national conference back in 2015. Our three presidents got together, and they decided that they would adopt the monarch butterfly as a spirit of international cooperation. But our president actually went back and brought together a board of scientists, actually a convention of scientists, and said, we need to increase the population of our bees. We need to increase the population of our monarchs. I want to see pollinator habitat on the ground. And we put quite a bit of money into that. The Fish and Wildlife Service, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, many other federal organizations really started moving on this, and it grabbed national attention. And it was at this point that monarch way stations really became important. And so you can see that Texas now has 1,253 monarch way stations. But look at itty bitty little Michigan up here. They have 1,167 monarch way stations. Now, it's a friendly competition, but it's a competition. 
Now, during the winter, we actually managed to pick up a few extra way stations along the way because Michigan's really cold right now. And they can't grow anything in the winter. So we pick up a few extra, but I have to tell you something. We were in within seven way stations of Michigan less than six months ago. And so that was pretty close. And so that makes me embarrassed with the other monarch conservation specialists. So I'm really hoping that we'll be able to see some um, improvement this year. Um, there is another state here. Let me see if I can point it out. In Illinois, Illinois. Indiana. Okay, that's really come up. And a lot of that now is working around some of the urban areas. Schoolyards, for instance, are seeing a huge increase in the interest of getting children out in nature and bringing monarchs into the classroom. And that's also creating new way stations. So in order to understand how a way station works, we're gonna go briefly through migration. So, over 3,500,000 acres of monarchs actually funnel through Texas into a living area that is less than oh, 3,500 square miles. That's a lot of monarchs in a very itty bitty living space. Those monarchs, that one generation that comes in from the north, this is the furthest north that milkweed can grow, and your summer breeding area is in here and through the Northeast. So this fourth generation of monarchs lives for eight months. It is the only generation of monarchs that lives for eight months, and we're gonna talk about that again. Those monarchs, around July and August, they'll finish breeding, they'll eclose, they'll come down here into Mexico over winter, come through about the beginning of March, lay their eggs somewhere around here, and expire. First generation is born, moves a little further north, lives 30 days and dies. Next generation comes up a little further north, lays their eggs and dies. Third generation up here in the summer breeding area, 30 days and dies. Fourth generation, eight months, starts all over again. I'm gonna break that down a little more because one of the most frequently asked questions I get, and particularly from some of the more southern areas is, it's November and I have a caterpillar on my tropical milkweed. Is it going to fly to Mexico? Or it's September or it's August and I have caterpillars on my milkweed. Will that generation fly to Mexico? So the annual cycle goes something like this. March, April, May is the children of the monarchs that were born in Mexico. That's your first generation of monarchs. Half of May, June, and July is your second and third generation, the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren of your monarchs that were overwintering in Mexico. Then you have half of August, September, October, we're going to call this your fourth generation, the great-great-grandchildren of the monarchs that were born in Mexico are going to be born here and they're migrating. But last year, something really unusual happened. We had a fifth generation of larvae that actually flew to Mexico. Very unusual. We had a late summer in, in September, October, and November. Monarchs were still breeding in Cape May, New Jersey. Is the climate warming? Hmm. <laughs> They were still breeding in Texas in November and early December, going to Mexico. Fifth generation monarchs going to Mexico. It's possible that monarchs are evolving. We're paying special attention to this. And we're gonna talk about citizen science, which is gonna become really important. So then your breeding season starts over again after migration. Okay, brief life cycle. The egg, very beautiful underside of a milkweed leaf, the monarch will lay 200 to 500 eggs. She will do this one at a time, generally on the underside of the milkweed, traveling up to 50 miles to find the proper plants. In times of drought, they'll play, they, they will lay multiple eggs on a single plant, but generally the behavior is one egg at a time 
on the underside of a leaf. Takes about five days to hatch, no bigger than the head of a pin. Very opalescent, pearly, beautiful, three-dimensional, domed and ridged. Once you find one, you'll find them all. But it takes a while to find that first one. Could be a white fly, could be what my friend Kip likes to call white schmutz. Okay, could be a number of things, but once you find the egg, you'll find them again. They're easy to find after that. There is no difference in the looks of a queen egg, a queen butterfly egg, versus a monarch butterfly egg. But you can tell the difference between the caterpillars, you can tell the difference between the adults, but you can't tell the difference between the egg or the chrysalis. Okay. The caterpillar stage is going to take about 20 days as they molt or shed their skin between each stage. So what you see here is the egg, the first instar, no color yet. They haven't started ingesting the milkweed. As they start to ingest the milkweed, the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth instars, you see two sets of filaments here, one on each end. A queen caterpillar will have a third set of filaments in the center of the body. A black swallowtail. Monarch's eating all my dill. I guarantee you the monarch is not eating your dill. It'll be a black swallowtail and it will have no filaments. Okay, so 20 days for the caterpillar. About 8 to 15 days in the chrysalis. About 30 days for the adult monarch except for the migrating adults, which will live up to 9 months. Male versus female, how many know this? Okay, how do you tell the male from the female? They do, and they're called endocoidal pouches. Can you say that? That's what I would ask my kids. Can you say that? Endocoidal pouches, right here. Right here and here. Originally swollen with pharaohs. And you'll also notice the males aren't quite as thickly veined as the females. Okay, so there's your Monarch Biology 101. Oh, that's not very touchy. Okay, Monarch Way Station requirements. One of the greatest things about Monarch Way Stations is they are very seldom humongous, okay? In urban and suburban areas, it is totally okay to have a Monarch Way Station container. You can put in two or three milkweeds, three or four annuals, have a beautiful full container of monarch goodies and certify as a way station. Now you can do a half acre garden, you can do a 5,000 acre ranch and certify it as a monarch way station, but there is no reason for you not to have one. If you have an apartment or a balcony, you can still do a monarch way station. There is no reason for anybody not to have one. A windowsill might be a little small. Okay, I'm gonna give you two ideas here. One is a fairly good sized garden. Okay, this corner of this garden is about, oh, 20 by 20, maybe 30 by 30. This Tim Hortons had a dirt filled median strip. He hated it. One of the conservation specialists said, I can fix that for you. She put in eight common milkweed, a couple of mint and some little low ground cover, had a caterpillar on the milkweed. If you plant it, they will come, okay? Don't you think that's a lot cuter than a gravel filled something or other? It actually had live critters in there. That's amazing. If you plant it, they will come. There's no upper limit, there's no lower limit. This is the Kerrville Shriner Park Butterfly Theater. If you are ever in Kerrville, we work there every Thursday. I like it because it has good layers for a garden, okay? So you've got a layer here of the annuals covering up and protecting your milkweeds. You've got your nectar here, right sort of eye level. You know, you go into a grocery store, they put all the really expensive stuff right here where you can reach it. They're gonna do that in the garden too. Here you have some protection and a place for your caterpillars to crawl and go off and pupate up there. Very nice little garden. But what if downtown everybody did vertical gardening? So here's one brave soul right here said, you know what, I'm tired of looking at brick. I'm just gonna hang a few window boxes, put some nectar out there. What if we added three or four milkweeds to that? I was telling, 
Barbara this, this afternoon. I went on a website looking for balcony gardens, and this lady had a video camera on her 11th floor balcony garden. She was video, she had a little window box with a few, I don't know, blue mist and a few things, and she was up in, uh, up in Illinois somewhere, like, I don't know, Chicago or somewhere urban, and she was on an 11th floor apartment. She had a window box, and she videotaped skippers, bumblebees, right? All kinds of little pollinators would come, and she had a video cam on it, 11th floor, the only one in the apartment building with nectar hanging out of her window, and they were coming. So we could do this. What if a bunch of people did it? What if a whole neighborhood did it? What if in your neighborhood you were the only one that did your backyard with nectar flowers? I drove into a lady's house at Austin. I didn't know where she lived. She lived in downtown Austin. She said, you won't have any trouble finding me. I was half a block away and monarchs were flying in front of the car. I thought, there's something going on here. Yard, 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 fireworks. There was more stuff going on in that yard. It was so beautiful. She had monarchs coming in and out of her. She was not difficult to find. It was a tiny yard, but she had two or three of her neighbors now walking in going, how did you do this? She didn't have the homeowners association yelling at her. She had neighbors asking her, how do you do it? And she would tell them how she did it. We can do this. We can do this. This is Terrell Heights in downtown San Antonio. How many of you have like a little turnaround or a, like a wedge? I forget what they call those. It's like a, you have a street here, a street here, a street here, and a middle. This is the middle. Tired of looking at it. They tried a little herb garden, didn't work. Can we do a way station? Well, let's try. This thing is like a jungle now. It's beautiful. They do events there. They have bike races. They bring kids over there. They do gardening classes. It's become a community thing. One thing about the way stations through Bring Back the Monarchs to Texas NIPSOTS program is bringing communities together. I mean, 15, 20 people in a community are coming together and they're having fun. They're bringing their kids, they're doing plant sales, they're bringing bike races in. So it becomes a lot more than just a nectar in a host plant place. Tim Hortons again. You've seen this. I just love it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll repeat myself. All right, so selecting your site. One thing that's going to be really important is you got to have five or six hours of sunlight for butterflies and nectar. Okay, it's got to have five or six hours of sunlight. Now, you can put some shade lovers in there, and you can do with two or three or four hours of shade if you have to, but it's got to have some sunlight to bring your bugs in. Okay. You also want to have it a little bit sheltered. Butterflies don't do well in the wind. They don't weigh a lot. Okay. They weigh about the, about the weight of a paper clip. So they don't do well and they need some shelter. So you want to find a sunny, sheltered place. Now I know in this area you have fair soil. A little further south you get kind of mucky, don't you? A, little, a lot of clay in the soil. But you have special milkweeds for that, I know, because I have seen them growing up out of your ditches down a little further south. And we'll talk about some of those milkweeds. But most plants, most garden plants, most nectar plants like a fairly light soil. So talk to um, Talk to your people with Nipsot and to your soil guys what kind of soil or what kind of amendments might you need to make sure that your little waste station flourishes. Or if you're going to do a container, just get a really good organic potting soil. Butterflies don't drink water. There is a myth that their proboscis is like a, draw, a drinking straw, but it actually is capillary action, which means they stick the thing in something and gravity pulls that stuff up. Okay, so they don't drink water like we do through a straw. What they do is they absorb moisture out of damp places. And one of their favorite things is damp cow patties, believe it or not. They like dung, but not fresh stuff. I mean, we have a little garden over there in Kerrville, and one of my volunteers thought she'd do a really great thing. And we have a little water feature that kind of like this dish over here. And she brought some fresh horse apples put them right in the water feature, and that's not exactly what we meant. What we meant was some well-dried, seasoned tablespoons of manure 
and you reconstitute it. You can use um, something as simple as a terracotta pot saucer, put a little playground sand in there, moisten it, don't leave standing water, but leave it moist, and that's what they'll land on. They'll just put those proboscis in there, capillary action will send the moisture up their proboscis, and they'll have the water that they need. Most of their water sources they'll get from their nectar. Shelter. Can you spot the milkweed in here? Okay, there's a tuberosa in there, a butterfly weed. But what we've done to offer protection to our caterpillars, now this is protection from predators and protection from the elements, okay? And so we've mixed it in because, let's face it, milkweeds are not the prettiest girls at the prom. Milkweeds are not really very attractive, but they're so necessary. So what we generally tend to do is we want to find some good annuals in the early spring and kind of put them in with our milkweed. And what that will do is we'll give the caterpillars a little shade, give them a little hidey hole to stay away from the insects because caterpillars are toxic to vertebrates. So it's not the birds we're worrying about. All that milkweed that they eat, the milky sap that's in there, that's toxic to things with spines. So birds can't eat them cats can't eat them or any of those things, but other insects can eat them. So giving them some kind of shelter like this is going to help them to avoid predators. It's also going to give them, it can get up to 102 degrees in Texas on the top of a plant. So what this is going to do is help them to create a little bit more shade. So we want to give them a little bit of shelter. Frequently asked question, what happened to my milkweed? It died. Mm. Be patient. Our native milkweeds senesce, okay? They go down underground twice a year. They come up in March, they go down in September, they, come back, uh, they go down in June, they come back up in September, they go back down in November, okay? Mark where you put your milkweed. Don't lose them. Organize your waste station. I'm serious. I have replaced milkweeds that grew up in abundance in South Texas, Laguna, Atascosa. We gave her 30 milkweeds. I lost them all, they all died. I went down there, 30 milkweeds were still there. They came back up in September, okay? They didn't die. Have patience, they'll come back. Pretty good chance they'll come back. But they need to be marked. You need to know where they are. So organize your waste station a little bit. If it's larger than a container, be sure and mark where your milkweeds were so you don't lose them. And don't kill them with kindness, okay? We're gonna talk about that too. So when you're selecting your host plant, a host plant is what the caterpillars are going to eat or what any insect's larva is going to eat. So in this case, we're talking about the monarch, so it's going to be milkweed, okay? You wanna mix it up a little bit. They're going to emerge at different times. They're going to bloom at different times. If you mix them up, you can hold on to mama monarchs a little longer. So you'll have the butterflies in your garden for a longer time. We identify through Monarch Watch three species of concern in Texas. These are the antelope horn, Asclepius asperula, the green milkweed, the Asclepius viridis, and the yerba de zizotes, the Asclepius anetheroides. These are what we call the three species of concern. These are in all of Texas somewhere. Okay, all parts of Texas somewhere. And then each region has specific milkweeds indigenous to those areas. We even have endemics to some of our areas. So you want to mix up your milkweeds a little bit. You don't have to be uh, mono with your milkweeds. Okay, mix them up. Have a couple of each. You'll have a longer season with your egg laying. Notice where your milkweeds grow wild. This is my asperula. This is how it looks when it's in the wild. I brought my asperula home and I put it in a really good place in the garden and I watered it and I gave it mulch and I fertilized it and it still didn't grow. That's where it lives. It doesn't get much water. 
It really doesn't like fertilizer. It's on a drainy, sandy, caliche hill in the middle of a field. Okay, don't kill them with kindness. Notice in nature where they grow. Take your cues from nature. Where do they grow? What kind of habitat are they native in? And then give them those environments in your garden. If they don't generally live near water, put them away from the sprinkler. Okay, put them away from the drip. Move the drip around them and put them away from the drip. All milkweeds are gonna need water to establish, but once they're established, generally they're not gonna need that kind of watering schedule. Here's your green milkweed, there's your milky sap. I put this picture in here because I want you all to remember one very important thing. Keep sap away from your eyes, okay? It's not here that's the problem. 10% of your body weight you would have to eat before you would have any kind of gut problem. That's true of animals, any, any vertebrate, okay? Pets, horses, livestock, children, any of those. 10% of your total body weight before you would have any kind of toxicity digestively. But if you get one drop in your eye, corneal abrasion, okay? Very nasty thing. I've only known one person in all the years that I've worked with milkweeds that's had a corneal abrasion. <laughs> I know better not to do this, so I did this. But I was still, had milkweed on my arm. It takes about four hours to manifest itself. Use great caution. Always wash your hands, keep your hands away from your face and your arm, apparently, away from your face, okay? I like to suggest the Asclepius tuberosa for schoolyard gardens. Schoolyard gardens are difficult to get across because teachers and parents are worried about the children getting sick or getting it in their eyes. Asclepius tuberosa does not contain milky sap. It's the only milkweed, and it's a true milkweed, that does not contain milky sap. And so there's no argument after that, right? Okay. Green milkweed, antelope horn, beautiful bloom, very, very um, attractive to other pollinators as well. This is where you'll see your juniper hair streak. This is where you're going to see all your little skippers, okay? Uh, bumblebees love this. Beetles love this. And remember that milkweed is a community. You're going to see milkweed bugs. You're going to see aphids. You're going to see other pollinators on here, okay? They belong there. That's their home, and they're all sort of interdependent on each other. You'll see parasitic wasps come in. It's okay. If you have a fifth instar caterpillar this big, he doesn't care if there's a few aphids on his leaf. He's going to chomp right through them. Okay? He, he doesn't see them. They don't taste like anything to him. He really doesn't care. He's going to chomp right through them. If the aphids are infesting the milkweed to the point that you're, it's creating so much nectar it's drawing ants then it needs a good hosing or i like to use the plastic squishing method with a glove okay then they need to go but a few aphids on a milkweed is not an issue when you're identifying milkweeds antelope horn looks suspiciously a lot like maximilian sunflower okay how are you going to tell the difference at this stage Tear your leaf, right? And then wash your hands really quick. Okay. Yerba de Zazotes. This is the really weedy weed. Okay, it's not very pretty. It's actually kind of pretty when it first emerges. It's got kind of a pink tone. We also call it side-along milkweed because it blooms on both sides of the stem. But then it gets really heavy, and a lot of times it'll just flop over. It looks very pretty with lots of gallardia around it. Um, this is more common probably in South Texas, pretty well distributed through the hill country and South. I don't think we see so much of it in your area. Am I right about that? Osher. Osher and Katy Prairie, they both have They have a fair amount, or is it common? It is. In the prairie, in Katy Prairie? Roadsides. Roadsides, too? Yerba? Really? Okay. Yay. Oh, good. Okay. I take it back. Got seeds? <laughs> I could use seeds. Okay. It does have a tendency to resemble silver leaf nightshade. It has that sort of lettuce edge. So you want to watch for that. Um, I love this plant. 
I love this plant, the Asclepius perbenus. It has a very high cardinaloid content, so it's a preferred milkweed for monarchs. The higher the cardinaloid content, the better the monarchs like it, okay? So Perennis is a really great milkweed to bring in if you can get a hold of it. And they have been documented. I always like to get documented pictures of monarchs using milkweed. Uh, these were taken by uh, Chris down in the Brazoria refuge area. Went down there a little while ago and uh, he took some great photos of these. Okay, Verticolata, the world milkweed, hard to say. Also very high in cardinaloid content. Uh, Bonat map says you also have that here. Have you spotted it here? Okay, great. And the Viridiflora. That's probably got to be probably one of the least attractive milkweeds. Very heavy bloom. The bloom itself weighs a good several ounces. And so that's why it begins erect and then almost always falls over. But it is a really, really um, juicy milkweed. I mean, it has a lot of leaf surface, so it can feed a caterpillar pretty well. I really like the idea that the leaves look kind of upside down. All the rib is on the top of the leaf. So it's a really easy identification. And butterfly weed. I know you have that here too, right? You have Asclepius tuberosa. And like I said, this one is um, very dark green leaf. I know sometimes uh, nurseries will try to sell you Kurosavica as butterfly weed, but just check the leaf arrangement. Okay, um, and check for sap in the leaf. Because if you break it and there is no sap, then you have tuberosa, otherwise it's the tropical. Which brings me to tropical. Okay, tropical milkweed is a great milkweed. And for a long time, we couldn't get a hold of very many native milkweeds unless we wanted to dig them up. And they don't transplant very well, frankly. And so tropical became sort of the milkweed of preference for many, many gardens for several years. But we were finding some issues with tropical in that it tended to, for one thing, it didn't go away when monarchs were migrating south. And what was happening was migra migrating monarchs would come down and they would break diapause and start breeding and laying eggs late in the season on tropical milkweed because everything they had or needed was there, the milkweed plus nectar, plus a nice little shelter area. And so there was research done and so forth, but I have a great handout just talking about the risks of tropical milkweed. I'm not saying don't use it. I use hundreds of pots of this to feed the caterpillars that I raise for education. It regenerates in two days. But there are solutions to some of these risks. There's higher disease incidence and so forth, breaking migration, interrupted migration. Um, but there are solutions to that. You can cut it back earlier in the season, cut it back in October and so forth. But a really great read if you get a chance to look at it. And I do encourage you to go ahead and take quite a bit of this information because it's really heavy to carry home. Okay. Many times when you go to a nursery, they will tell you, we don't spray, okay? And I believe a lot of them. Maybe they don't spray, but do their vendors spray? Systemic pesticide will stay in the vascular system of a plant for 120 days. I go and get five pots of tropical milkweed from a nursery that said, no, we don't spray. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. We have never sprayed. We never spray. 40 caterpillars die in 48 hours. You don't spray, but they're vendor sprays. We have to really, really check what we're doing. Home Depot, Lowe's, and those, they are actually starting to try to reduce neonicotinoids. As a matter of fact, they even have a tag now that says, this plant is free of whitefly because we use neonicotinoids. They make it sound like a good idea. But they have reduced to 20% their live goods used with neonicotinoids. That's a baby step. That's a good baby step. Lowe's actually, I think they made some kind of deal because Lowe's took neonicotinoids off the shelf but didn't stop using them on their live goods. Home Depot kept neonicotinoids on the shelf but stopped using them on their live goods. 
So we just have to be really careful where we're sourcing our nectar in host plants, okay? We'll check into that, great. You can collect, propagate, and clean. Uh, cleaning is really fun, especially if you have cats or you wanna do it under a fan or don't do it in your house. Um, I have a couple articles on the state NIPSOP webpage uh, if you want to look into that about cleaning and collecting. Um, when you select your nectar plants, I would say it's the same thing. Look for a good combination of leafy, herbaceous, and woody plants. Look for spring, summer, and fall, particularly fall bloomers. Because again, these monarchs are not breeding, they are gaining weight. They are the only migratory animal that we know of that gains weight when it migraines. Migraines. <laughs> I have my When it migrates. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to mix these up. We're going to have at least four annual, biannual, or perennial. That's what they're calling their minimum. Now that's a container. There's no reason why we can't all create one monarch way station. Blue mist flower is the top of my list, my blue ribbon plant. I don't care what kind of blue mist flower you put in there, whether it's a crusida or a eupatorium or the, I can't pronounce that, conoclinium, okay? Blue mist flower is gonna pull your pollinators in. It's like a cloud. You'll get your queens, you'll get your monarchs, but you're also gonna get your fritillaries. You're gonna get skippers, you're gonna get sulfurs. You walk into this and it's a cloud of butterflies coming up. They love this stuff. This is the spring to summer plant. There's also the thoroughwort for your fall bloomer with a very similar bloom, that same sort of uh, very fuzzy bloom on top, blooming white. So you have, I don't think you have bone set up here, but you have other eupatoriums that are fall bloomers. Yes, oh, you do have bone set, okay. So we definitely want to put something in for fall and I would highly recommend you look at your eupatoriums, your bone sets and your thoroughworts for fall. Okay, still my favorite spring flower, they just go and go and go. Coreopsis, by the way, is another great one. Um, basket flowers, another great one. You have some great plants right here, whoever brought these in. These are some great annuals and perennials to use in your garden. For spring, that's what's covering your milkweeds. Um, you do real well with salvia coccinia here because you have that wonderful moisture. I'm so jealous. You have such great humidity up here and you can do these sorts of things without frying the ends of all your leaves. <laughs> the lyre leaf sage, um, these make a wonderful mat. If you have, like I know where I am, I get a lot of issues with ground cover weeds and these lyre leaf sages make a huge mat which pokes out pretty much any uh, non-native invasive that wants to make a mat. And lyre leaf sage is also a great hummingbird flower, I think. Um, the giant blue sage, this is a wonderful uh, plant to put in there because they're so tall, they're kind of a preferred uh, chrysalis plant. They branch out pretty good. Um, so a lot of these caterpillars like to use the taller woody plants to go off and pupate. And they'll make their chrysalis out there. So you want to have some taller back of the border plants that have some good structure to them. And if you don't have that, a little piece of trellis or something, some place for them to pupate and hide out for eight to 10 days in that very vulnerable state. I know it's not Lantana Harita ever, nor, but I'm never changing it because it smells so bad when you crush it, and I love that name. It's Urticoides now, I think. Um, but the Texas Lantana, very brilliant, very vibrant, wonderful plant. Turk's cap you already talked about. I have a little green eye in there mixed in. Uh, the liatris, there are several liatris through Texas. We have the Mucranata there. I don't know which variety do you have here. Okay. So you, you have a, and it's a wonderful fall bloomer again, have those nectar plants ready for fall. Maximilian sunflower you have here, right? Okay, you make a nice straight line fence with those. Be careful where they run. Be sure and share everything you have extra. But these are brilliant and I do almost all my tagging. They're um, very attracted to Maximilian sunflower and frostweed where I am. Do you have frostweed? Yeah. 
Yay, frostweed is key. To, please don't mow it. They love frostweed and they love Maximilian. They're easy to tag at those levels. Don't forget your grasses, okay? These are great protectors, bring in a little bit of shade uh, and some structure to your garden. Also a great hidey hole for your caterpillars. Um, and it's a host plant for some of your smaller skippers. I put this in here for two reasons. One, I love trumpet creeper, and two, I hate trumpet creeper. <laughs> I don't know about you, but it's really invasive. So I put it in a pot, and I put it next to my fence, and it grew into the ground in one season, and now I have trumpet creeper everywhere out of a pot. But it attracts more butterflies and hummingbirds than any other plant I have planted, so I put up with it. But it is a wonderful, wonderful vine. So if you decide to put it in your pot, just be sure and move your pot often. <laughs> I didn't move mine for two years. Okay. Pest control. Don't do it. We have one reason for pest control, and that's to get rid of insects. What's a monarch? Insect. Insect. Don't do it. Keep it separate from your very favorite roses and your very favorite tender perennials that we need to fuss with a little bit because we can't use pest control in the Monarch Way Station. Maintenance is not going to be bad once you've got it established and you've done your little bit of watering and you keep a little bit of weeding and you re, um, reconstitute your soil occasionally. Maintenance is not difficult. Watering is just to get established if you're using your good native plants. Um, watering should be kept to a minimum. Don't kill your milkweeds with kindness. Fertilizing, I do get this question a lot. A water-soluble fertilizer is okay, okay? It's okay for your larva, and it's okay for your adults, and it's okay for the nectar in the garden. But let's not use the granule weed and feed and that kind of thing. But a good water-soluble fertilizer can bring you on some new bloom at the right time and encourage your blooms, and it won't hurt your insects. Weeding, of course, nobody likes it, but everybody does it. Mulching is something I want to mention. Caterpillars have very soft bodies, and it's very difficult for them to climb over great big chunks of bark, okay? So in the Monarch Way Station, try to keep your mulch soft, either shredded or just kind of a mixed topsoil, not gravel, not chips, okay? Think of having to crawl across it on your own tender belly. That's what your caterpillars are going to be feeding, okay? So anything you would crawl over, your caterpillars will crawl over. So think about that when you're mulching your Monarch Way Station. Deadheading. I don't generally deadhead unless, one, I'm forcing fall blooms or forcing blooms in general. I let my garden go over winter for several reasons. Bees like to use hollow stems for overwintering. Chrysalis many butterfly species overwinter as chrysalis. If we're deadheading and cutting down our gardens in the fall, we're removing the overwintering chrysalis. Now, this isn't true of monarchs, because we know where they overwinter. But black swallowtails, admirals, painted ladies, and a few others overwinter as chrysalis. So if you're bringing your garden down to the ground in November or December, you've just removed next year's batch of butterflies, some species. So if you do that, just check over your twigs and logs and things for chrysalis, because you may be removing the insects you're trying to attract. I just want to say we just finished our fifth year of Bring Back the Monarchs to Texas. We are now up to about 200 public sites we financed with about $40,000. Fish and Wildlife Service joined us last year with a donation. Um, Monarch Watch is still an active partner, and we move on with this, and lots of schoolyard gardens, public sites. So think about your community areas, your public access areas, um, and maybe get involved with some of those areas and think about applying uh, for 2018. And we open the application process up uh, usually around the 1st of January and try to get those grants out uh, the first week of March. So this season just closed, but I think we're doing a fantastic job and we've done a lot of Monarch Way stations so far. So yay for us. Yeah.
you may decide that you would like to do a little bit of citizen science and help us with some data research. And so you might think about a few of these things, and I have information on these here. I actually train people to monitor their larva. You'd think it would be as easy as just looking underneath, yeah, there's an egg, but there's a method to the madness, and it's actually a lot of fun, and it's important research. Do you know that um, somewhere around 70% of uh, research now on, specifically on monarch data and other data, 70% of that research now, um, databases come from citizen science research. So citizen science has become a really important tool in the data research uh, world. And it's really, Journey North is another one that you, well, we'll go through as I have them here, but tagging monarchs. So this is netting a monarch, putting a little adhesive tag on their wing, and then releasing them, and actually collecting them. We have people that collect the butterflies in Mexico and source the tag. It's entered into a database, and we find out where did they come from, how long did it take them to get there, how long a flight did they make, um, when was it tagged. For instance, we had one tagged back in 2000 in Gramanan Island, Canada. That insect that weighed no more than a paper clip traveled 3,310 miles. Now, I haven't even traveled 3,310 miles in a car. Okay, this butterfly traveled over 3,300 miles on the wing, and that's as the crow flies. We don't know what really, what, what directions he took, but that was as the crow flew. So this information is becoming more and more important to us as we learn what kind of migratory habits and how these insects are evolving with the changes that we're making in the environment and the landscape. Whoops, sorry. Journey North, they actually have a real-time map. You can see where the monarchs are now, and you can see when the monarchs get to your area. This is important to me because I actually collect eggs for education. I want to raise these monarchs. When are they going to be in my neighborhood? It's going to be important to anyone interested in gardening for monarchs because when do I need to get my milkweed in the ground? Right? You can report. It's really easy. You just go to the website. You click on Report. You sign in, you tell them you saw an egg, or you saw your first milkweed, or you saw your first adult, and you're out. And you become a little white dot on the map. You can find yourself in your, your station, and you can follow yourself on uh, Journey North, and they have an app for that, by the way. And uh, I just want to say that Monarch Joint Venture has made it possible for me to get out over the state of Texas and bring this information to you. I have many uh, informational handouts here, everything from schoolyard gardens to conservation talking points and go monarch gardening. And uh, I'd be very happy if you would take your kids and your grandkids or visit a school or think about a schoolyard garden because if we don't teach our children today about what we're talking about in this room, because I know I saw a couple of kids in the room but very few outreach programs that I do, unless I'm actually visiting schools, are to people under the age of 39. So teach the children. Thank you very much.